Welcome one and all. It's time for some more painting. We've got Abyssal Dwarf grotesques right here. And more of them off camera and their base, obviously, as well. So we've got quite a few people watching this already. You'll recall, if you were watching yesterday, that we applied the nice Mordant Earth Citadel Technical Paint over the top of the lava, and this is what it looks like now. It's nice and crackled and very tasty indeed. So the only thing that needs doing to this base now is just some edge highlighting on the crystals and that will be completely done. The grotesques need a bit more work, obviously, because they're not just bases. And this is how they're looking at the moment. Let's get a nice focus right up to the camera. This sucker. See how close he wants to get before it'll focus properly on him. Well, you get the idea. That's how they're looking right now. So this was with some dry brushing and then the orange contrast paint. So very spicy indeed. Today we're going to do some more dry brushing on them with different colours. Then maybe we'll get round to another stage of the process as well. Got more of them over here. You can see already Hopefully you can see in this lighting that they're a bit more complicated than just the black that they started yesterday in. And today the skin might be completed. And after that it's just going to be a question of going over all the other stuff on them because they have quite a lot of accessories on there. We've got Steve in the chat already. Hello there. Right then, let's make a start. I'm going to do some dry brushing on these grotesques first. And then we're going to do something with the base. Let's not forget that this guy is still here, by the way. I haven't seen him. Did anyone see the episode of Vermintide last night? With Mr. Remington Steele. That was a drama-filled experience. I'm sure everyone enjoyed that. Everyone that tuned in, obviously. If you haven't, then of course you can do so at any point. So, we're going to want orange fire. And we're also going to want the medium dry brush. And we don't have to be too neat on this because we're not. To painting any of the details yet. So we'll fix those later. So I've just splodged out some orange there. I do need to get some more orange paint eventually. And time for the dry brushing. Blowing some dust away from the area that I was moving most of the paint from this brush just to make sure I don't pick up any annoying particles that get stuck to the model. That would be a nightmare scenario, I'm sure you'll agree. So, here we go. We're not going to go too nuts with this dry brush. It's not utter precision, but we're not going to go into as much as we did with the white dry brush yesterday. We don't want to press it down into anywhere, we just want to get only the raised areas. We want them to still be quite dark when they're finished. We're going to do the raised areas, any obvious raised spots in this orange, and then we're going to do the corners in yellow after that. So it's still going to look quite dark, because only certain areas not these colours. And then on their bodies they have these kind of inlays that are almost tattoo like. So on any of those areas I'm gonna do a bit more dry brushing around there to bring those out a bit.
These are very nice models. And if you saw my previous episodes, you'll see how easy it was to convert them as well, to change the poses. Nice soft resin, which is easy to work with. Being much lighter with the dry brush today than we were with the white one. Don't want it to look too orange. Tame that darkness. Feel free to drop comments in, by the way, if you, anything you want me to talk about. Speaking of things to talk about, there is going to be an Andy and Rem show this Sunday. And in a, a marvellous technical innovation, we're going to have a brand new intro as well. I look forward to it. I'm not going to say too much about that because I want it to be a surprise. So, like I said, not going too crazy with the orange here. I'm not pressing it in as hard as I was with the white yesterday. Okay, let's compare this to the one that hasn't been dry brushed now. Not sure whether the camera picks it up the best here. But yeah, I think you can see there, can't you? There are certain spots that are definitely much more visibly orange. Sure, I've hit all the spots I wanted to. And then when we're going to do the yellow later, it'll be even less prominent. Just on the very tips of things, pretty much. Not worried about catching all the other details because nothing's painted yet. Okay, done for now. Next. It's got some very muscular legs. So with the effect that we achieved yesterday with the dry brushing and the contrast paint, we're going to have several distinct shades of flesh. Deep down in the crevices it's going to be pretty much black. But it's black with a hint of kind of browniness to it because of the contrast paint, which does affect it a little. And then it gets gradually lighter and lighter on the raised parts of the model. So we should have four or five different, subtly different shades going on. Despite not having to do that much work to the model at this point, it's all been very straightforward so far.
zoom with this guy. Okay, there we go. Seven people watching at the moment, but a lack of comments, and this disturbs me greatly. Who have we got in here right now? Next. Considering the time of day and Steve is in here, I'm going to assume that it's his day off. Owen is here as well, making sticky date pudding. That pudding made from dates, as in the edible food sauce, or is that thing made from sticky dates, as in you went on a date, it was sticky, and you put that into a pudding somehow. Or any other meaning you can conjure up. So, just after I went off the air last night, I did receive the parcel which contained the oath mark. But a small glance through it so far. I will be having a proper dig through that at some point soon. And I'll <clears throat> report back on my findings in video form. Provide some interesting content for people has been some curiosity about that system. Steve is doing some knife work, so being careful. Five days off work, well that's a rare treat for you, isn't it then? By the sounds of it. Almost no. And who's next? This bad boy. Some more orange. I'm going to place an order for some orange paint soon. And I was going to get it from Element Games recently, but. They're having some supply issues with that particular colour. So I'm thinking I might order it from Mantic since they're stocking Vallejo game colour now. But I want to reach the free postage threshold, which I think is about 20 25 pounds at the moment. They lowered it during the pandemic. So to see what else I want to get from Mantic. I can stock up on paints, obviously. 
but that's not going to reach the threshold. So I'm looking at other Mantic products that I want right now. Whether that's going to be the small Kings of War rulebook for convenience sake, or maybe something else. They've got some good deals on at the moment. The Kings of War two-player starter set is looking quite cheap. Got the Walking Dead game heavily discounted as well. Get something for one of the factions that I'm currently working on. And says yes, as for the Oathmark book, I figured it would be a good way for you good way for Rem and you to play with any army you have. Yeah, we'll definitely have to have a, a browse of it. If anyone didn't know that was a donation from Owen. I'll definitely have to get in there and have a look at the rules. At least one person has claimed so far that it's superior the game systems because of its use of D10s. I'm not particularly nailed down to a certain kind of dice. I don't feel like I've got any kind of emotional attachment to D6s particularly. Even though I own a lot of them. Starting a game system that has a different uh, shape of dice. If anything, it's quite exciting because you get to buy more dice, because normally you can't really justify spending that much money on dice. We have a vast collection. And there's something fun about them. Steve says Mantic website have just released an Easter egg hunt to get a discount code on their website. Well, that's exciting. Is the Easter egg somewhere on their website? Or is it on their Facebook page? Or... We got one guy left to dry brush in orange after this. Going to turn our attention to the base early. Okay, last one. 
Who doesn't like Easter eggs is more of a hot cross bun, man. Maybe I'll have to look at the Mantic newsletter season. I have a bad habit of ignoring newsletters. Because I think, well, I'm on Facebook, I keep up with all the news anyway, so why do I need to see it all condensed in newsletter form? But occasionally you will see something you can on there. I'm going to do some edge highlighting on the base crystals after I've finished dry brushing this guy. And after that, we'll dry brush these guys yellow. Be another quick task. We're only going to be going for the corners with that colour. Once all the flesh is complete, I'll have to decide what colours to do everything else. The metallics are going to be mainly gold. I'm not sure whether the chains will be gold or silver yet. Obviously, there's a very strong gold motif through this army consistent, but at the same time don't want every unit to look identical. Try to mix things up. Yeah. Want everything to have the same theme, but just a slight twist on it. Okay, just going to have a quick look at the first guy I did. Just to make sure I haven't got progressively way, way, way too far orange as I went along. Sometimes there's a temptation to make the dry brushing heavier and heavier as you go. Lose some of the subtlety, so it's best to just go back to the start. Just to make sure everything's still weren't too subtle on the first one. But they're all looking good to me. So we can stop there and just wash this brush. Steve says, those mark models look pretty cool. As for the game, I'd be interested in seeing it, but I've got a feeling it's remove models from the unit game, and I couldn't go back to that now. If it is a case of removing models from the unit when they die, then that would be annoying, but I do have nicely based up on individual bases war army from Wahamadi. I would have an army that I could actually use for that purpose. I think my entire undead army is like that as well, even though it's mostly Mantic models, because I was originally using those as vampire counts in Warhammer. I was just using Mantic models because they were very cheap. And the zombies are better than GW zombies. Owen says I use a wound counter for that. So does that mean removing models from the unit is not a thing or is optional in the game? I haven't looked too much through it yet. I just looked briefly at some of the stat lines and it looks fairly similar to other comparable games. Okay, 
Here's the base. Time to edge highlight some crystals. So, we're going to want to splodge a bit more orange in here. And some white. Now to select the best brush for this job, I have to get one with a pretty decent flat edge. So let's have this one looks okay. We are gonna put this down a bit as well, you don't want it to be thick. The problem with removing models is it changes the size of the... Yeah, that's one of the issues I had in Warhammer Fantasy. When by the end of the game you would have just five dudes running along with a giant movement tray hanging off them. And sometimes you couldn't even remove the movement tray if it was skeletons or zombies or something. Because you were going to bring back models. It would get very, very messy. You would have movement trays sitting on top of movement trays and lose track of where each unit was supposed to be. And it... It just took needlessly long, I think. Okay, we've got a nice orangey colour there, nice pale orange, which we're going to use on all the crystal edges. So let's start with the big ones because that's less dating. Less edges. And take the edge of the brush along all these little edges here. And then any time I make a mistake, I'm just going to go back over that later and fix it. The bound to be mistakes. Pretty similar to dry brushing this, but with wet paint. take a huge amount of time this but it sometimes feels like it does and occasionally you'll miss particular facing like on those crystals at the front there I know I'm gonna miss a few so many you can only see them from a certain angle and sometimes the angle you're looking at it from naturally illuminates the edge and kind of makes it lighter. I think you've already done it. Are from Bad Squiddo Games. A second pack of them.
seen some people do a really good job painting their crystals better than I could do. Um, not that concerned about them looking like masterpieces though, because they are just base decoration centers. Models themselves that are sitting on the base. As long as they don't drag down the quality, fine by me. Little bits of little chips out of some of the crystals, which are meant to be there. I'm just going to go around and just. Gently paint the edges of those, which make them stand out a bit more. It says Annie does some really cool stuff, doesn't it? Yes. I think one thing I'm waiting for from Bad Squiddo at the moment is from the last Kickstarter. And I couldn't remember what I actually pledged for when the pledge manager came. So I decided, you know what I could use? Chickens. I am dead halfling on. Because lots of the armies that I can use those models as Audia, Undead, or Empire of Dust. Some of those armies have swarms. And I could actually turn the chickens into swarms. If I paint them as ghosts, ghost chickens, then they could actually be very useful. So I think I ended up purchasing 30 chickens. I'm just going to do plenty of swarms. Owen likes her Viking figure. Yeah, there's quite a lot of those. Quite a varied range now. I mostly go for the base decoration stuff and the animals. I think we're done with that side. Any lack of neatness there is going to be tidied up later. It won't show up too well on the camera, probably. But it just adds something to them. It gives them a little bit more realism and depth. Obviously, there's a lot more that can be done on them. You can paint them as if they're transparent and have shades giving on them, reflection, all kinds of madness. But that's a bit too advanced for my liking. Steve uses chickens as waiver markers, that's not a bad idea. I think about the first thing that I purchased from Bad Squiddo Game. Probably. Uh, probably before it was even called that, I got a dice bag back when she was making dice bags. That, I would have got some dice. And I've, I've used quite a few of the miniatures. 
My dead zone ribs have got a few bad squiddo squiddos in there. with this crystal blob here now. Onto the little crystal blobs at the front there. Yes, brave Sir Robin is not a fan of the of Bristol. I had a really bizarre dream last night that I was pitching an idea for a film and there was no interest in it whatsoever. And I even had legendary actors on board as well, but no film studio was interested in taking it on. It was a film, and it, I don't really have a good memory of the plot, even though I'm pretty sure I laid out the plot in the dream. But the main thing that stands out is that there were these three really villainous characters that were teamed up somehow and they were all played by really infamous well I don't know if the actors would be described as infamous but the characters they play are often very evil and I think all the actors are in their 70s and are still alive I think last time I checked so theoretically it could be possible it was Malcolm McDowell uh, Charles Dance and David Warner. And they all agreed to take part in the project, but I just couldn't get it off the ground. But can you imagine those three guys working together? That would be amazing. Steven Seagal was not involved. I did once make a fake a film poster featuring Steven Seagal. A film called Triple Dead Overkill. 
featuring Morgan Freeman as a psychic janitor who uncovers crime with his mind. It's about three. Yeah, what is it? What is it with threes in the films that are conjured up in my mind? There's three different time traveling murderers were coming back to kill somebody or something like that. And Morgan Freeman informs Steven Seagal of this so that he can prevent all three murders taking place at the same time. So really, I could combine these two projects, reactors I just mentioned, as the villains. Well, they might be getting a bit old to be time traveling assassins. Well, it sounds like Owen is a big fan of this idea. Maybe I should. Not that I have any connections in the film industry, really. I vaguely know people that have been in not-so-well-renowned films. I mean, says there's a fourth Matrix film being made. I think I'd be interested to see that. I didn't despise the second and third one as much as some people. Almost done with these crystals, having to endlessly rotate it to see if I've missed it. And I'm going to have to tidy them up with some regular orange. Steve, has any of you ever watched the first Matrix film? Well, I think the others are definitely worth a look. The first one does kind of stand on its own. 
but the others are definitely worthy of existing, I would say. There are plenty of film sequels that don't deserve to exist. I've been watching a lot of films recently because before the lockdown came into effect found a huge box of DVDs at a charity shop for a very low price. So just finished the Bleed trilogy. I'd never seen the second and third one before. Third one I don't think is very good though. got some cool stuff in it but then it's also a little bit too a bit cheesy best way to put it compared to the other two Owen says they swear too much in the third, second is more action oriented, and third is kind of more battle scenes. Uh, yeah, the first one, I'd compare it in some ways, the first two, kind of like the same way the, let's see, compare it to Alien and Aliens. The second one just kind of turns everything up to the next level. Not necessarily similarities in theme, because in some ways I think the second bleed has more horror elements in it. But then bleed trinity, it was just missing something. It's lacked some of the soul somehow. And while some of the additions, like Vampire Dogs, were amusing, they probably detracted from the overall feel as well. They got a bit too overconfident with the CGI in the third one, I think, as well. the first and second, I think they actually reined in what they were going to do with CGI because they weren't confident in how it looked. Some of the elements they wanted to use, but then in the third one it seemed like they, there was less quality control perhaps. Considering it's, you reach a point, don't you, where you, they get just far too confident in that stuff. If you look at the early use of CGI in film, Look at the really good effects in things like Jurassic Park and Terminator 2. Because they were probably scared of it looking bad because it was this new technology. So they just used it wisely and sparingly and in conjunction with other effects. But then later on people just thought, hey, we can do everything with CGI. And it started to look awful for a while until they really mastered the craft. Nowadays it's really hard to tell. So good at Duke J. Rambo in the house. Okay. So I'm going to put this brush away. 
So giving it a bit of a soap. And I'm going to get a smaller brush, fixing the little crystal mistakes. Luca says, Blade Trinity was just an iPod advert. Every time that girl thought she put her earphones in, how could she hear people around her? Yeah, I did think that was a bit weird. I thought the two additional characters... Unnecessary might be a, a strong way of putting it. I think they were too thrust into our faces, though. I think if you were going to continue the series and you wanted to incorporate more characters, phase them in then fine. But I think as the final film, you didn't need all that. I think there was enough they could have done. Mainly focusing on the central character. Yeah, it, it was stylish, but it lacked the substance of the first two, I felt. Okay, let's get a small brush. Let's have this one here. It's not a very good quality brush. Just a nice little cheap one that came in a set, but it's got a thin point. That's what we want right now. So we've kind of covered this entire little plastic bag in orange. I'm going to turn that around to find a piece that isn't. And drop some orange on there. And let's get fixing. After we've done this, we'll do the next level of drawing on the grotesques. And then we might be able to come back and varnish these crystals before the spray. Azuka says, just remembered she was Whistler's daughter. Now, if she was Whistler's mother, that would have been interesting and weird. Yes, that would have been quite funny. And since vampires don't age particularly, then they could have played with that somehow. If she was a vampire and gave birth and then wasn't a vampire or something. I don't think it would be worth it just for that joke, though. I really didn't like the main villain. I thought he was a major, major step down from Blade 2's villain. Considering he was supposed to be like the original vampire. Yeah, I think he had an American accent for some reason. Deep red in the chat. Good afternoon. 
thinking some crystals here. Nearly finished with them. Just touching up any little imperfections. Gonna be back to the grotesque. Oh. Yes, Bazooka, the Mr. Bean movie did get there first. Mr. Bean movie. Weird one, because when you look at all the elements, taking the character out of his familiar habitat into another environment, and when that happens, it's usually a recipe for disaster. When you try and scale up very small, kind of weird, but also somewhat down to earth character, take them into this weird, larger than life scenario. And it can go horribly wrong. But that film is probably one of the more successful examples. As far as I'm aware, it's not universally despised. And says lol rumba. So I assume you're not talking about the film rumba, just responding to the G one. Most of the films I watch are terrible. Well, they're not terrible intentionally. I watch them intentionally knowing they're going to be terrible. I enjoy watching really bad films. Basically, behind miniature games and sports, that's probably... Put that down as my number three hobby, quite possibly. There's a, few, a couple of YouTube channels that I watch a lot of films on. There's one that I would recommend called Kings of Horror. Now, they call themselves that, but many of the films on there are actually really, really poor, which is exactly what I'm looking for. That's why I recommend it. It's really, really bad. Really cheaply made, really abysmal horror films. When you ask your average person, do you like bad films? They may say something like, yeah, I really liked Transformers, even though it's bad. Or, yeah, I love Troll 2. Yeah, these films are like multiple levels below Troll 2. Incredibly amateurish. Another YouTube channel which focuses mainly on. I'm not sure whether it's strictly like ethnic minority films, but it's mostly films in the American black community. I've seen some other ethnic minorities on there as well. It seems mainly for that type of content. But those are also really bad as well, and it's called Maverick Movie. Just really, really poor acting. And the main issue with those ones, because they often have good equipment, like a, a, a decent camera to film it, but they have really, really terrible 
But it's not even that the storyline's terrible, it's that they don't really have a storyline most of the time. I think you'd have to watch a few of them to understand what I mean by that. But most films have a plot. Like, here are your characters, here's what they're trying to accomplish, here are the struggles they have to overcome to get there. But on that channel, YouTube, many of those films, they don't follow those rules. They have characters in situations, they often don't really struggle and overcome anything, and things just kind of happen without it being any kind of logical story progression. Sometimes they don't have endings. If you want to know the worst film that you could possibly find on the internet? Just to get a taste of the kind of thing I look for, I would recommend looking up Owen says such as Santa Claus vs. the Martians. Santa Claus vs. the Martians is better than most of the stuff I watch. You want to look for a film, type in Hip Hop Locos on YouTube. Find that film. It's only about an hour long, and I put that as the worst film I've ever seen in my life. And I did have to watch it twice though, because I wanted to expose different people to it, because it's so bad. So that is the greatest example of god-awful, just horrendous piece of filmmaking. Hip Hop Locos. About two wannabe hip hop artists who want to launch their rap career by ripping off all the local drug dealers. Stealing. It's just really bad. I explain why it's bad, it would ruin the surprise though. Go and watch it for you. Go and says sounds like a punishment. Well, if you enjoy watching things that are bad and enjoying them, either on an ironic level or if you're watching them with other people and you can all make fun of it together, then it's actually a fun experience. If you want another taste of a really, really awful film, then look for Abe's Tomb. That's like a, a vampire slash zombie story. I say story. It's awful. That has some of the worst acting I've ever seen. I can almost call these crystals done now. A few little bits I've spotted that I missed previously. Deep Red says, the worst film I've ever seen is called Skinned Deep. It's not scary, just weird. Yep, I've got that on DVD. That is definitely not in the bottom 50 of films that I've seen. Nowhere near. Probably not even bottom 100. It is bad though. Although I don't regret seeing it because Leitz is such an amazing character. I do wonder where he gets all those extra plates from. The best part about Skin Deep is probably the fact that they didn't have permission to film that scene where the guy was running naked down the street.
and they actually got in trouble for that. Nope, definitely not in the bottom 50. group of people that I watch these terrible films with over the internet, we have a list. And if, it, if the film doesn't live up to certain standards, certain basic filmmaking principles aren't applied, then we put it on a separate list that's not even... We don't consider them to be real movies. Because they're so bad and they just lack things that you need to be considered a, a real film. And Skin Deep would definitely not make that list too good. I could, I could name some really awful films for you now. I'm going to pull up my list of some of the worst. I'll go through some and tell you which ones you should look up. Okay, let's see. Anonymous Invitation. That's a really weird one. You should look that up, though. Let's see. Basket Weave. That's a really bizarre one. I'm sure everyone's heard of Birdemic, Shock and Terror. But that's like a, that even that might be at the upper end of some of these, even though that's considered one of the worst of all time. Blood sucking redneck vampires. Just trying to give you some of the best examples here from the list. Clown around. That's actually a British one. Let's see. Easter Bunny Kill Kill. Fatal Deviation, which is an Irish martial arts film. Feeders. Fist of the Vampire. Oh, this one's really bad. This one has two titles. So the first title it has is Female Slave's Revenge, and the other title is Apartheid Slave Women's Justice. Okay, here's another one. Gay Bed and Breakfast of Terror. Let's see, there's so many, like, there's one just called Killer Clown, but there are so many Killer Clown films on here. Las Vegas Bloodbath. Most of these are not comedies. O.C. Babes and the Slasher of Zombie Town. That's a really bad one. Satan's Whip is one of my personal favourites. Sloppy the Psychotic is another killer clown film. The Aborted.
the Seekers. Bad ones. Wood Chipper Massacre. That's really amazing. There's the Zombie Bloodbath Trilogy. So Zombie Bloodbath 1, 2, and 3. Yes, yeah, so all of these I would recommend. Okay, that's all I'm going to give you for now. If you've managed to watch any of those, then let me know. And tell me what you think. I think these crystals are done now. Make absolutely sure, because the paint is going to rapidly dry. And won't enjoy having to pour out some more paint to finish the job later. So I'm just going to make sure everything is perfect right now so they can be varnished afterwards. I assume most people have seen The Room. And says, what about some yellow edge highlights? Well, these base crystals. When I was deciding on the colour scheme for the army, I decided I didn't want them to stand out too much. I don't want attention drawn from the models. So I decided to keep them very simple and not too much colour going on. So if you look at my Greater Obsidian Golem, then you'll see that there is actually a bit of yellow on his crystals. Because I want him to stand out more base. So I'm kind of intentionally toning these down. Steve says he'll give watching them a miss. Well, you don't know what you're missing out on. I would recommend if you're going to watch them though, do it with a group of people, at least one other person, because it's going to be really awful and you'll get, most of them you'll just get bored if you're watching it on your own. You'll get bored and angry. If you're watching it with other people, you can laugh at the incompetence together and make jokes about it. Some people just don't have a tolerance for watching terrible things. Yes, Bazooka's definitely seen the room. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. What kind of drugs, Denny? Okay, we're going to put that to one side while well, the crystal's dry. And let's move back to the grotesques. So we're going to be dry brushing again. So we'll get the medium dry brush back out and yellow. I need to buy some more yellow as well. Obviously, this is a Citadel yellow, which means it's going to dry up. It's a Citadel paint in one of these pots, and it's not a technical or shade. So, let's see. Let me get some paint out of the lid. Yeah, there's a bit in there. So this is going to be a very, very light dry brush here because we don't want it to look yellow. Which is weird since I'm applying yellow, but I'm sure Painters among us out there know what I mean. This is just for the very 
corners and tips. So very very light, just over spots that we want it to be in, not every. Way fainter than we were with the orange before. I will expect all of you to go out and watch all of those films that I just recommended, by the way. And then you can report back. We're not applying this yellow so it'll look yellow. I just want it to look like the base colour is just lighter in these areas the light or what happened. You've got to be careful not to add too much. I like that guy's morning star looking hand really cool. Yes it is. Almost done. So let's compare him to somebody else and see if you can spot any kind of difference in them. You can probably see it, the sky's a bit lighter now in areas. The camera doesn't pick it up the best, it doesn't look natural there. But in the... At least it's occupying in front of my eyes here, it actually looks better. That's pretty much his flesh completed now. So let's move on to the next guy in the production line, which is him. Some more yellow. And then get rid of most of it. And here we go. Steve says, I don't really like horror movies, any rubbish action films worth watching. Yes, Fatal Deviation. Very, very low budget Irish martial arts action film.
almost done with this guy already. But he was quick. Okay, next. Let's not drop them on the floor, that would be bad. For anyone who wasn't here at the beginning when I announced it, by the way, this Sunday there will be an Andean Rim show by probably in the evening. With a very exciting new intro style. It's going to blow your socks off. Okay, that's him done. Now onto this guy. And says, long shot, I've got a unit of wrathmongers that need repairing the flails. And the chains are way too tiny to glue. Or pin back, what would you do? Hmm. Flails need repairing. Are they plastic? If something's plastic, I don't consider it ever beyond repair. With poly cement. I've dealt with miniatures that had metal chains on before, which were very thin and annoying. And sometimes I'd just completely cut them off and leave them off the model. But as a general tip for chains and anything that's kind of frail and fragile in general, multiple connection points. If it's only connected to the model in one spot, consider attaching it somewhere else as well. Like if you've got a really thin skeleton arm, consider attaching the head of their weapon to their head or their shoulder or something. It's just a general tip if you've got fragile parts on a miniature, especially if it's metal, you've got just a tiny little arm. I'm sure you could apply the same principle to other materials though. Oh, 
already. And two left. Because it's like trying to glue the side of two five Ps together on their side. Hmm. See how that could be challenging. What I would try to do in that situation, if you were actually just sticking two coins together on their sides like that, I'd just lay them down flat, of course. You probably can't do that with whatever you're trying there, so I would consider trying to build up some kind of frame around them so that whatever you're sticking can lie flat and just stick without needing any assistance from gravity operating. Often I'll have like paint pots like this and if someone's arm isn't sticking on properly like wedge the model between the paint pots and have the arm resting on something so it's all held flat the different pieces that all need to be sticking together. Like a scaffolding around it. Okay, on to the final guy. So this one's going right in the middle of the unit. He's another big boy like the first one, like the champion. It's the same body as the grotesque champion. Nearly done with this now, which will be all the flesh completed then. That will just have to go in and paint everything else on them. It's going to take longer than this probably, there be more precision work required. Owen is leaving us now. Thanks for joining in. Okay, I think this guy is basically done now. I think I've succeeded in making sure no one looks yellow. They are nicely I like. Go back and check the first guy now. I got a little bit more on to
Okay, the think on done with the flesh. If in the cold light of day, when I have a look at them, I think that maybe the dry brushing isn't clean enough or there's just something missing, then it can always be reined in by applying some kind of wash over the model again. And that turns it down nicely. That's what I do with my lesser obsidian golems because I don't want the highlights on them to look too stark. So I put a black wash over the highlights on those. So that's always an option after you dry brush it. And if you're worried about obscuring all the work you've just done, you can always thin down the wash. And then apply just as many coats as necessary. Giving this a good soaping. Okay, putting the dry brush away for the moment. And have a bit of a close-up of him, shall we? Get it to focus in on him nicely. It did focus really well a minute ago, didn't it? Maybe that's good enough. It's kind of ready orangey colour skin. But it won't look like that when it's finished because the details around it will change that quite significantly. All the spikes are going to be painted in various colours. I've decided if they're all going to be bone coloured yet. That's something I need to work on. And the claws and all the metal on them. I'm considering doing all the metal in gold, even the chains. Some of them have shoulder pads, like the champion here. Big shoulder pad there. And this weapon is obviously a separate part that's been stuck on him because he's a champion. Okay, so what we're going to do now is, I think, varnish these crystals. I think I'm satisfied with how they look. So we can just go straight in there with the anti-shine varnish on these bad boys. Army painter anti-shine matte varnish. Anything that's not metal, that's usually all I use on them. It's metal, I usually put gloss varnish on first and then this over the top. Sometimes it doesn't get rid of all the shine of gloss varnish immediately, so you have to let it dry and then just dab more of it on until all the shine's gone. So we're going to drop this. onto some plastic and then apply from there. Then it's going to be a very quick task. I 
thing with this varnish, if you're pl applying it over an area that you've put washes on, sometimes it can start to break down the washes. You have to be careful. First of all, you have to give them long enough to fully set and dry. And then, when you're applying it, make sure that you're not kind of brushing it all over the place with the strokes, because you can brush the varnish off, or brush the washes and thin coats of paint off. Got to be careful. Most critical thing, though, is when you're painting over, when you're varnishing something that's had washes applied to it, do not keep varnishing the same area while it's drying, because that'll definitely just lift the wash or the shade straight off. Deep Red is off for a bite to eat, but we'll be watching the rest later, apparently. Not going to be too much more of this, I'm sure. Finish this varnishing. There's not a huge amount left to do today. We can just put the lid back on this varnish now, we're not going to need any more. With this varnish you also have the option, with the lava effect, of painting over it with this. And that you can paint it, over, paint over it with any kind of clear stuff, really. But if it's something you're going to be handling a lot, these cracked effects, or something that might be a bit flexible, then there is a chance that bits of it can start to flake off. So I don't do anything with them on my bases because they're not really going to be handled that much. But on the wound markers that I use. I actually painted over the lava effects with Lamian Medium. Which allegedly will hold them in place a bit better during rough handling session. Okay. Done. Once all that varnish is dry, the base is completely finished. And that can just sit one side until the grotesques are ready to be pinned to it. There we go. With them being crystals, of course, you could consider using gloss varnish to paint them. But that's not the look I was going for. Didn't want any kind of shine effect on this army. It to look very matte, apart from the gold armour, in which case the shine is represented by the silver highlights rather than any kind of varnish. Okay, finished with that. Anything else we should touch on here before commencing our lives? Anything else anyone would like me to discuss here in the last few minutes before we wrap this one up? So, plans for the next few days, because I'm going to be doing some more painting tomorrow, 
they start picking out some of the details and doing the base coats that will allow the gold to go onto the metal areas on the grotesque. In brown, I'm going to be applying the brown first and then the gold over the top of the brown rather than painting gold directly onto black. So we've got details like, for instance, his weapon here and his shoulder pad, which are going to be gold. They'll be getting a nice coat of brown on them. And there are a lot of spikes that I'm thinking probably a bone colour for them. They have lots of tiny little spikes on them as well. I have to decide whether they should be bone colour also. And many of the models as well have kind of straps around the weapons that are just kind of slapped on the end of their arms. So I'm thinking the straps. Should they be black or should they be orange? Decisions, decisions, because those are the two colours I've used for all kinds of uh, fabric on this army. Mostly orange, but there has been some black as well. So decisions to be made there. And these on the end, they, I'm not sure whether they're actually bone or whether they're just big pieces of rock slapped on the end of their wrists. So I need to decide what to do with them as well. Big toenails, big spikes on the back of the legs. Could just go for bone colour on all of those and the spikes on the back, spikes on the head, spikes sticking through the arm. Do all of those in bone colour, unless anyone has any other suggestions. And when all those are done, it'll be back to this fella, the big lava rock rhino of doom, the Hellfiend. Put him on hold a little bit so I can finish everything else before I get back to him. And then it'll be time for, once all those are done, the Night Stalkers, including this hideous monstrosity. But I want to order some paints before I really go too nuts with them. Like this guy, for instance. I've just put the first few coats on, but I want to get some more pinks and purples before I really jump in at the deep end on them. Maybe some greens as well. So I may make an order from the Mantic website since they're stocking Vallejo game colour now and they've actually got them in stock right now. Last time I checked, unless they've all sold out. So, yeah, if you were planning to buy any, leave it a few hours so I can get in there first. Okay. So, we'll be back tomorrow to commence with the painting. And don't forget, on Sunday... Andy and Rem show coming at you with a snazzy new intro. We'll be discussing everything that we're doing for the last however uh, many months it's been since the previous show. Can't be that far off a year now. And looking at anything that's happened in the world of Warhammer during that time, Age of Sigmar stuff, and the old world news, those Kislev leaks that they put out there. So, some juicy red hot sizzling live. Content, the kind of stuff you'll want to get you through a lockdown and I'm sure you'll be very appreciative don't forget to like this video by the way don't forget to subscribe if you're not already some kind of lunatic who hasn't subscribed yet and check out all the links in the description all the social media shenanigans down there I've got the Facebook group I've got Twitter I've got all that madness there's various fundraising sources down there if you want to give me all your money for some reason and other than that I think that's it just looking around, see if there's anything else I want to mention before we drop this one. And I think the answer to that is... No. But do check out other videos on this channel as well if you haven't watched any of the live-streamed PC gaming action. There was some Vermintide with me and Mr. Remington Steel last night, which was very entertaining. If you want to check that out. And I've also been playing Space Hulk Deathwing. I'll do another mission on there soon as well. Possibly tonight, maybe tomorrow. We shall see. Uh, all that remains to be said, I think, at this point, though, is good night out there. When is it not really good night, though, is it, at this time? Let's go with a good afternoon instead. Good afternoon out there. Whatever.